go ahead. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on which time zone you're in. My name is Bea Spiller. I am a fellow and the Transportation Program Director at Resources for the Future, though I only recently joined and have been previously at Environmental Defense Fund, where I co-created this webinar series with Fortune Nunell from Institute for Policy Integrity. And I'm very delighted to welcome you to this webinar. Today's conversation is the last in a series of webinars organized by EDF and Policy Integrity with the generous support of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Environmental Defense Fund is a nonprofit environmental organization that uses science and economics to find practical and lasting solutions to some of the world's most pressing environmental problems. Institute for Policy Integrity is a nonpartisan academic think tank dedicated to improving the quality of governmental decision making. They use economics and law to support smart policies for the environment, public health, and consumers. Now, given the organizational goals, Birchin and I have been delighted to be working on a series of webinars highlighting the ongoing energy research funded by the Sloan Foundation. Now, our goal in these conversations has been to bridge the gap between academic research and real life policymakers. To that end, each of these webinars has brought together academic researchers funded by the Sloan Foundation with policy experts who work on these topics on a daily basis. Now, our intention is for these conversations to help inform policymakers with the latest insights from cutting edge research and results in better policies. At the same time, we intended for these conversations to help researchers identify open policy questions and better understand how they can focus their research for a higher policy impact. Now, this is our final webinar of the series. And after a great run, we are ending this series with a topic that is central to many policy discussions around our transition to a clean energy system. And that is how we value and compensate distributed energy resources. As we move towards a more distributed grid, ensuring that distributed resources are fairly and appropriately valued and compensated can help bring about better outcomes, more efficient adoption and use of these technologies and greater energy independence for everyone. So without further ado, I would like to turn the microphone over to David Brown, who will be moderating today's discussion. David is an associate professor at the University of Alberta's Department of Economics. He holds a Canada Research Chair in Energy Economics and Policy and is the president of the Canadian Association for Energy Economics. His research lies at the intersection of energy economics, industrial organization, and regulatory policy. As recent work considers questions in the electric sector, ranging from market design, market power, and pricing mechanisms for demand side management and emerging technology adoption. So um, take it away, David. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm excited to moderate this session today and, and appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, so today we have four leading experts who have extensive expertise and knowledge into the regulation of distributed energy resources. So we'll say DERs from here on and the design of DER compensation policies. Uh, I, I think this conversation comes at a time that is a really critical time as regulators debate the future of retail rate design and the role of DER. So I think this mesh of academic and policy is a really, really good um, format to address this challenge. Okay. So let me overview how this process will work. So each speaker will get approximately six minutes, followed by a moderated Q&A session by, held by me. Then we're gonna open up the floor to your questions. Uh, please write your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Okay, so to start, let me briefly introduce the speakers um, and then we'll get the ball rolling. So first, um, Dr. Bea Spiller is, a, is gonna present. She is a fellow and the director of Resources for the Future's Transportation Program. Bea is an energy economist with experience working on electricity and transportation issues, with a particular focus on electricity pricing for achieving greater adoption of distributed energy resources. She has participated in numerous electric utility proceedings in New York and California, with the goal of ushering in a cleaner, more efficient and equitable energy system. So Bay is going to kick us off with an analysis of retail tariff design and how this impacts the DER adoption. Then we're going to move to Dr. Birchin Nunell. She is the Energy Policy Director at the Institute for Policy Integrity at NYU School of Law. She is an expert in utility regulation and environmental and energy policy. She leads policy integrity's stakeholder involvement both at the federal and state level 
in front of regulatory agencies such as Public Utility Commissions and FERC. Burton's work that she's gonna present on today provides new and interesting insights into the impact of information barriers on the adoption of DERs. Then we're gonna to move to Dr. Michael Karamanis, who is a Boston University professor of mechanical and system engineering. He researches complex stochastic production systems and decision support in real-time electricity power markets. He currently focuses on cyber physical energy system that is open to developers and users and enables distributed resource management to mitigate congestion and realize these important synergies among sustainable energy technologies. So Michael's work today is gonna to analyze the potential for other forms of DER compensation that kind of take on a more technical and granular time-based and location-based structure. Lastly, we're gonna wrap up with Paul Phillips. Uh, Paul Phillips has significant advocacy and advisory experience in California energy and communication policy. He oversees the retail rates group at the California Public Utility Commission's Energy Division, evaluating statewide pricing strategies for an evolving grid, including the design and implementation of time of use, dynamic and real-time pricing to promote electrification and affordability. So Paul's gonna wrap us up by, going, by providing an important policy-focused perspective and discussion of ongoing strategies and initiatives in California. So I think, you know, obviously California is really big in this, so it'd be great to, to see his insights. All right, so enough from me. So I'm going to kick it over to Bea. And uh, yeah, you have six minutes. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Share my screen. All right, great. So today uh, I am going to be talking about residential electricity tariffs and how these affect the incentive to adopt DERs as well as utilize them. Now, the reason we care about residential electricity tariffs in this setting is that across the country in the United States, the, the primary way in which individuals are compensated for the distributed energy resources is through net energy metering. Now, because net energy metering makes the meter run backwards when you generate, it means that the price that you are paid for exporting equals the price that you pay for importing, which basically means that the underlying residential tariff will define the compensation for your DER. Now, economic theory states that if prices are cost reflective, this leads to optimal decision making by households. So we should see a better in alignment of investments in DERs with minimizing the underlying costs. Now, the issue is, is that most residential tariffs across the country are not cost reflective. And they're not cost reflective in many different ways. So let's begin with the volumetric portion of the bill. Many individuals face only flat volumetric rates that do not vary over the time of day. However, we know that the cost to generation does vary over the course of the day. And so by having flat volumetric rates rather than you know, one of these options as shown in the picture to the right, you are um, you know, not incentivized to consume during low system cost hours. A second way in which residential tariffs are not cost reflective is that most people are not charged for their contribution to capacity, either at the distribution uh, uh, at the distribution level or in the generation space. So they don't face demand charges, uh, which means that they have uh, less of incentive to reduce their contribution to capacity costs. And finally, many volumetric rates incorporate non-variable costs. That means that fixed charges are bundled into a volumetric rate. This will therefore artificially inflate the volumetric rate much above the level it should be. So this means that the residential tariffs are just generally not cost reflective. And so what we wanted to ask the question is what happens when we change the underlying tariff, when we move towards incorporating more and more cost reflectiveness into the underlying tariff? starting with the volumetric portion of the bill, moving on to capacity charges, and, and then you know, full-fledged into a fully cost-reflective tariff. So to be able to answer this question, we engaged in a massive economics engineering simulation project. This was joint work between EDF, MIT Energy Initiative, and Institute for Policy Integrity. 
This is a massive research project. It was funded by the Sloan Foundation back in 2017. And we calibrated the model to the Commonwealth Edison service territory. So this is a local electric utility in Illinois. And we worked with them to get uh, data and made sure that the model was, was calibrated accurately to their service territory. All right, so what did the simulation project look like? Well, basically what we did was we started with downloading 30 minute interval data from for over 44,000 households in the Commonwealth Edison service territory. Specifically, we looked at three uh, zip codes in Chicago area. Now taking these observed loads, what we were able to do was calibrate the model utilizing an economic utility function to be able to estimate preferences for households, uh, preferences for consumption in terms of thermal and non-thermal loads in each hour of the day. So once we had estimated these preferences to be able to reduce on computational costs, we clustered households into 45 representative households based on the timing and the magnitudes of their peak. The next thing we did was we created a set of revenue neutral electricity tariffs based on the underlying costs in the Commonwealth Ed service, uh, in the ComEd service territory. These revenue neutral tariffs vary from sort of flat volumetric, not cost reflective at all, to uh, what we would call the most cost reflective tariffs. And we included everything in between, including time of use and real time prices, critical peak prices. Next, what we did was for each of the clusters, we ran their, their demand through a cost minimization optimization given the underlying electricity tariffs. For each electricity tariff, we ran a new optimization. And what we allowed each representative household to do was to choose the distributed energy resource that they wanted, as well as the size, and then the patterns of consumption in order to minimize total energy costs. From this, we're able to know you know, which, which of the clusters adopted, which types of DERs, and what size of DERs were adopted. We also had information about electric bills and environmental impact, but today I'm going to be really just focused on the DER adoption results. So our main findings um, to begin, we found that uh, regardless of compensation, rooftop solar was actually too expensive to see adoption in Chicago. Now, this is, might seem surprising or surprising to us as well, but this really had to do with the fact that we are using 2016 costs and in Chicago, there's not that much sunshine. And so given where the costs were at, the, the upfront investment costs, uh, it just was too expensive. And in fact, ComEd told us that they really didn't have any solar adoption during that time. So it, it sort of validated what we were seeing in the real world. But what we found was we ran the simulation with the lower installation cost, and we found that once installation costs declined, then the underlying compensation did begin to matter. So at 50% installation costs, which means that the cost went down by 20% due to the 30% um, investment tax credit. So with a reduction of 20 percentage points of the installation costs, what we found was that time of use and real-time pricing actually resulted in the largest solar adoption and largest average panel sizes. Our third finding was that as we move to really cost reflective tariffs, these cost reflective tariffs had the lowest volumetric rates uh, due to the fact that they weren't sort of artificially incorporating some of the fixed costs. Now, what we found is that under these really low volumetric rates, adoption of solar and batteries was really hindered. However, we did see that households were, would invest in heat pumps, especially larger households. Our final finding had to do with batteries. And what we found were that they were rarely adopted, regardless of the cost reductions or, or the underlying tariff, and that they had to drop significantly to see adoption. However, what we did find, which I think was really interesting, is that when we incorporated a carbon price into the wholesale market, this helped facilitate adoption under all tariffs, except for the cost reflective tariff that had the lowest volumetric uh, portion of the bill. So to conclude, um, this simulation project demonstrated to us that residential electricity tariffs, because they affect the compensation that DERs uh, are given, and if it would therefore affect the net present value of the investment and thus affects the decision to invest in DERs. 
Now, our, our finding that moving away from volumetric based tariffs reduces the incentive to invest in generation DERs, but increases the incentive to invest in beneficial electrification was an interesting uh, trade off finding. And so, depending on what the policymakers' sort of optimal goals are, they may want to choose one type of tariff over another. Now, there's still some open questions. For example, what's the interaction between solar and, and electric vehicle usage at the household level and how does underlying tariffs affect that? I think this is a question that would be really important to explore. Furthermore, I think another open question is to understand better how traditional demand charges, which is those that charge you for the maximum demand uh, every month or every day, how that affects the decision to adopt DERs. This was not something that we were able to model, uh, but it is an open question because there's a lot of policy debate about whether or not to include residential demand charges uh, in this way. So I will end there. And just to note that once the slides are up on the website, you can follow the links in the final page to get to our papers and to our web page describing the project. So thank you very much. And back over to you, Dave. Great, thanks, Bailey. That was really great. So, just to keep the ball rolling, um, we're going to kick it over to Birchin now. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Let me share my screen really quickly. Um, all right. Um, great. So, Dea, Bea was talking about the role of tariffs, residential retail tariffs, and what I'm going to do is to start talking about the other side of the coin and talking about uh, different compensation schemes and the role of information in DR deployment with uh, these compensation schemes. But before that, first I want to recognize the team behind uh, this pr project, uh, my colleague Yuri Dworkin from NYU Stanton School of Engineering, Sylvia Bialek, who was a fellow at Policy Integrity and is now now at the German Council of Economic Experts, and Jip Kim, who's at Columbia University, and Anmar Khan, who is a PhD student at Tandon School of Engineering. So what is um, what is our motivation behind this project? As you know, Bea and Dave both uh, talked about, DERs are really important, and the debates about DER policies, compensation policies, rate, rate design is really intensifying. And we know DER is a central piece of clean energy transition. But when you look at the analysis, both economic and engineering models that you know analyze DER um, adoption and deployment, and you know usually inform policy discussions, we see there are some important factors that are missing. Information and strategic uh, interactions are two of them. You know, most of these models um, come from a central planner's perspective, cost minimization, everybody knows everything, there's perfect foresight. Yet we know that that is not how grid works. There are lots of information asymmetries, nobody has perfect foresight. You know, regulators and utilities and consumers act strategically, consumers know their preferences, utilities don't, utilities know their distribution network properties but DR aggregators or regulators don't. So there are lots of information problems um, in the sector, and we wanted to understand the role of information in, in the outcomes given by different DR policies. So what are our questions? We wanted to understand, you know, what are some of the important information problems in, in, the, in the sector um, and how these problems affect efficiency of outcomes. So we're talking about the level of DR deployment, the composition of DR deployment, you know, the costs, obviously, emission outcomes, um, et cetera. And then we wanted to understand what the implication of these problems for outcomes under different DR compensation. So obviously, there are lots of debates around net metering, but what are successor policies? You know, we have value stack or even a theoretical ideal of DLMP based uh, compensation and how these policies behave under um, under information uh, asymmetry and other information problems. So what we did is we started with stakeholder interviews and surveys. We talked to some people in New York who are in the DER space. Using our those using those interviews, we designed a survey uh, for DER stakeholders. And we surveyed 13 different states. We looked at what are some of the active important DER dockets. We sent our survey to everybody on the service list for those uh, um, for those dockets, we got feedback from uh, utilities, um, you know, DR specific um, 
organizations, NGOs, customer, um, you know, customers and regulators, then using that information from our surveys, we improved our modeling. We have multi-stage game theoretic models where there's actually strategic interaction between regulators and utilities and DR aggregators, but then we um, incorporated the important asymmetric information dimensions based on our survey. So we looked at imperfect foresight and we also included belief functions about um, certain criteria. So if DR aggregators uh, don't have complete information about, say, distribution network parameters, but they have a belief about it, what happens? Then we analyze the effect of, you know, these kinds of asymmetries on DR deployment and looked at how different compensation mechanisms uh, behave and affect the, the outcomes. So from this project, we have a lot of papers. I obviously don't have time to get into these, but you know, some of them are under review, some of them are already uh, out, and some of them are in progress. You can find all of these on both my website and on my colleagues' website. I'm going to talk about several key insights from the project overall. Um, so first of all, obviously, there are sub substantial information problems. You know, you don't need to do a survey. If you're working in this space, you know that there are information problems. But what is interesting to us was that the in information problems were heterogeneous across the country. So what is important in one state was not necessarily important uh, in another state. And there were key uh, dimensions of information asymmetry, there, you know, key concerns, interconnection processes, how non wires alternatives were valued or demand response response policies, but the two critical uh, dimensions was distribution network information, um, such as hosting capacity and consumer demand data. So what we did is we modified our models to take into account information asymmetries on these two aspects. Then when we look at, looked at our baseline analyses, uh, where there is no information asymmetry, we have this interesting result where um, the social welfare uh, under more granular and more accurate uh, valuations, such as DLMP based valuation or even, you know, coarser value stack performs better compared to a net uh, net energy metering based on flat rates. Um, so, and when, when I'm talking about social warfare, I'm talking about, you know, consumer surplus, utilities profits, DR aggregators profits, and as well as uh, emissions and subject to, you know, power flow constraints, uh, et cetera. Then when you take into account some of these information problems, for example, if you add imperfect foresight or if you add information problems about hosting capacity or information problems about consumer demand, you see that social welfare goes down and, you know, the DR rollout is um, you know, much, much less. You see that uh, you see the outcomes change and we lose some welfare. But what is interesting to us from a policy perspective is that this welfare, um, despite this welfare loss, the ordering of different compensation policies do not change. So still, you know, if you have a compensation mechanism, mechanism that could more accurately value DERs based on underlying capacity, energy value, or environmental value, you gain a lot of efficiency. And despite the fact that there are information losses and welfare goes down, well, that ordering doesn't change. And we think this is an important policy result because, you know, one of the arguments for a simple policy like net metering um, is that it is simple. You don't need to do much. You don't need to know much. Uh, you can just put the meter and then, you know, it could work, but our results show that, um, you know, it is worth considering um, more accurate DR compensation because the efficiency gains by being able to direct DERs to say a congested bus uh, is so high that it offsets potential losses, um, potential losses based on information. So I know I'm out of time, so I'm going to stop there and happy to answer questions during the Q&A. Great, thank you, Bertrand. So we're going to go over to Mike. So can you hear me? Yeah, you're good. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, so um, I'm going to uh, talk about um, uh, DRs and uh, pricing in the context of uh, dynamic 
and adaptive uh, prices um, uh, that are space and time uh, sensitive and which take into, into consideration uh, constraints of uh, networks um, that are involved. The um, Obviously the um, electricity network, but um, uh, other networks as well, such as the gas network, the uh, communication network, as you will see when we talk about uh, distributed energy sources that uh, can um, actually uh, transport port around their, their, their requirements, their demand using, uh, uh, using um, the information networks. Uh, uh, these, these, for example, are uh, server farms. So, um, so for networks to be sustainable, for networks to be uh, um, developed uh, such that um, they um, are the, 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 so, so that their expansion is efficient and so on, the interaction between networks and the and the pricing of um, distributed energy resources as well as other uh, participants in a market, uh, other uh, agents connected to these networks are concerned. For the electricity network, uh, we are sort of taking a sort of, you might call it a maximalist view, but we are looking at um, tariffs that um, uh, capture uh, the full uh, description of the product that is being essentially traded in um, and exchanged in a, an electricity network, transmission and distribution. And this involves the famous three Rs, real and reactive power. Um, reactive power is uh, for, 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 for the sort of the generalist here uh, is something that um, has to do with the with uh, with a pollution of the of the of the of the electricity flowing on those on the on on, on the transmission lines that increase losses that uh, gobble up uh, resources and capacity uh, and which has to be compensated and it turns out that um, uh, distributed energy sources DRs are very important in in being able to uh, to contribute to, to buy and sell or to to inject and withdraw the active power so as to compensate this, uh, to do away with this, uh, this pollution um, of reactive power. So that's the second, R. real power is the, is the electricity that we are all uh, accounted, uh, we are all accustomed to, uh, reactive power and then reserves, because reserves are very important to maintain the reliability of the system. So, so at any point in time in, you know, when we, when we plan in the day ahead market, we, um, uh, we buy and sell energy, we buy and sell uh, reserves, and uh, we buy and sell reactive power. So the, um, the pricing and uh, the actual sort of marginal costs that, it is, that, that, that would come into the picture here for determining at least one part of the tariffs, you, you might have... Um, you might have a two-part tariff, you know, with some sort of constant uh, value to compensate for, um, to, to make sure that the, that um, uh, there is enough compensation for, uh, for the full cost, for the fixed costs. They have to take into consideration the, the impact on uh, transmission and distribution networks. Transmission networks have different constraints, such as uh, for example, congestion constraints that are important in distribution networks uh, also have different, uh, different constraints that have to do with the capacity of um, service transformers, capacities uh, having to do with the voltage that has to be maintained. So um, essentially, if one wants to take this uh, sort of, as I said, maximalist approach, one should look at the transmission network and then uh, at the fringes of this transmission network, you have distribution networks where most of the DRs are connected, right? Which, uh, which uh, interface with the transmission network at the substation. 
So, um, you know, this, this gives rise to a huge system, right? Uh, with thousands of uh, nodes uh, at the transmission network and millions of nodes at the distribution networks, multiple distribution networks that sort of interact through the transmission network. So um, the idea is to be able to uh, to calculate the, the, the correct prices and compensate DRs and charge uh, consumption for those three Rs, the real reactive uh, power and reserves. Um, there's a lot of coordination that has to take place because of the fact that um, particularly renewables are um, not controllable. And um, there's, uh, there's a lot of opportunity to be able to do that uh, by taking into consideration uh, when um, real power is available, um, uh, where and when, and uh, when the demand is needed and, 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 and how distributed energy resources can adapt. The adaptivity is extremely important here in determining the, in coordinating and determining these reserves. So, so here is a, an example of uh, transmission constraints <clears throat> that cause us to uh, have to spill a lot of uh, wind power, for example, if you're if the if the if the supply the chip supplies on the on the wrong side of the constraint. Here is where um, uh, server farms, for example, may transfer their um, the requirements, their demand, uh, and uh, bypass the the, the constraints. Um, also, uh, the, the the DRs can uh, can can provide an, an incredibly uh, valuable service by using their uh, capability to to uh, exploit to put their their uh, something that we call inverters. Every photovoltaic uh, installation, every electric vehicle has a smart inverter that converts direct current to, to, to uh, alternating current, which we have at the, at the network, and direct current is produced at the end of the panels and it goes into the battery and so on and so forth. So, so putting, putting this in, in dual use can provide a lot of valuable resources. Uh, we did a study that's kind of similar to that, that looks at some uh, results that are similar to the ones that uh, uh, Birchin uh, mentioned, which is pricing with um, sort of some average cost-based pricing. That's a pricing of today. And um, uh, net metering is part of that. Uh, then pricing at the, <clears throat> at, the, at, the, at the substation where the DRs are are connected. These are the LMPs, uh, location and bunch of prices, and then DLMPs that, that add into the marginal cost at the substation, the additional, the additional costs that, um, that factor in um, uh, constraints at the distribution network. And uh, if we look at adaptive um, uh, DLMPs, social welfare and costs overall are better, even um, even even consumers who um, um, who are not flexible can uh, uh, can benefit because everybody else adapts to the marginal costs and decreases the marginal costs. The the hosting capability uh, of electric vehicles, for example, with existing uh, resources at the distribution network increases immensely, and so on. So so um, this is what we have um, studied. And, and of course, for, for these ideas to be implemented, what one needs uh, some sort of a platform that, uh, that shares this information and coordinates uh, across uh, distributed energy resources and uh, generation and inflexible demand and so on and so forth. So pricing for those three Rs um, allows us to sort of um, uh, efficiently and um, economically efficiently uh, put together and coordinate um, everybody who is connected into the network and also have coordination across networks. 
uh, and other networks, as I said, is a natural gas network, for example, which, which can uh, send and store um, uh, natural gas in locations where you have, and during those hours uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, gas turbines, for example, uh, require that, uh, uh, that service. Anyway, so I have to mention quite a few uh, collaborators in research. Some of this research was funded, and actually a lot of the conceptualization has taken place as part of a Sloan Foundation grant, but there are other um, uh, funding uh, opportunities that uh, have provided to that. So, and, and some selected publications. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. So we're going to move over to Paul. So Paul is going to give us some much more of a, maybe maybe not much more, but a more policy perspective on, on what's going on in California. Thank you. Good morning, guys. So let me share my screen one moment. Let me pull up some slides here. Can everybody see that? OK. Um, I'm Paul Phillips with the California Public Utilities Commission. It's great to be here with uh, some truly amazing experts on in this area for DERs. I'm going to try to jump right into it, uh, setting the stage for a series of policy problems that we're facing in California and how we intend to resolve it uh, through uh, rate design and demand response integrated programs. And so um, just to jump right into it, I wanted to say that, uh, you know, we've been doing a bit of forecasting and, and realize that over the next decade in California, in addition to just general reliability issues that we're trying to resolve and wildfire related problems, um, our rates are escalating rather rapidly, our retail bundled rates uh, for various reasons, largely because of wildfire expenditures, but other, other issues. Um, and this is a concern. We wanna make sure that we are uh, moving forward quickly with uh, electric vehicle adoption, electrification generally, decarbonization. And what we don't wanna have happen is our, have our retail rates somehow uh, intersect with uh, gasoline prices at some point. So. Um, I can already tell you that even though this, <clears throat> this uh, forecast that you see here for electric gas and gasoline prices at the household level um, was done about a year ago, I can tell you it's already out of date, <laughs> as is often the case with uh, complex forecasting, and that we already know that our retail rates are, are rising even faster than this. And so we have something, we have a problem here that we need to fix. Uh, we're working on it. I just want to give you a backdrop for how things are, are operating in California. And obviously the, the rate of inflation is also increasing faster than what this represents. So uh, we know that um, we need to be careful. We know that we need to move forward with um, uh, great caution in terms of how we manage our retail rates and our rate designs, which is what I really want to talk to you about today. Um, so California's electric grid has a number of challenges that we're trying to uh, address all at once. Um, you know, you've heard of the infamous duck curve, some of you. This is really the statewide demand curve that we're trying to tame uh, to some degree. We have uh, concerns about the trough of that duck curve or the belly of the duck, as we say, in terms of uh, renewable curtailment. We're having uh, too many uh, solar resources in particular during uh, certain times of year, certain times of day uh, that need to be addressed. And we have, um, you know, this is a problem and for, for two reasons. Number one, we're we're uh, increasing renewables rapidly, heading toward a 100% uh, clean energy grid. Um, and this is sort of exacerbating uh, some of the problems that we see with regard to our uh, ramping, you know, coming out of that trough during the day or that low part of the day for demand and then increasing quickly around the, the early evening hours as people are getting home and turning on lights and, you know, cooking and, and street lights are coming on. And so the grid is spiking and we're seeing on occasion some reliability events that are being called by our system operator that we want to effectuate, that we want to address, excuse me. And so um, what we're finding is that, you know, the problem statement here is that our retail rates and our demand response programs are somewhat, you know, effective, fairly effective at addressing some of these issues, but they're um, on islands. They're not really integrated. They're not synced up. And um, they're a bit confusing for certain operators. They're a bit confusing for some of our parties. Uh, and so we want to provide a more integrated solution going forward um, through demand, a, a demand flexibility management framework. And so um, the idea here is that, you know, we realize too that there's not a centralized framework in California where people can go and figure out what their energy price is very easily, as, as strange as that may sound. I mean, it, the information problem that was discussed earlier, this is very much true in California. We have asymmetric information around DERs and DER pricing. We have asymmetric asymmetric information um, around uh, bundled retail rates. And so we want to start moving out of what we now have as a baseline of time of use rates on a default or mandatory basis uh, throughout most of the system. 
um, and move steadily toward opt-in real-time pricing and eventually a transactive network in California. So we have, I have a paper here that I'm sort of summarizing for you. Uh, the paper will be out in public uh, next week or the week after. Uh, we are launching a new rulemaking in California to support rapid long-term electrification around these ideas. Uh, we want to leverage more effective demand response programs and bring them together with our retail rate design strategies of the future. Uh, we want to accelerate California's clean energy goals by addressing um, the most pressing grid issues that we just talked about, including renewable growth, uh, electrification, a steep ramping problem on the, on the duck curve. Um, and we want to promote fair and secure compensation of our distributed energy resources. That is uh, not a reality yet. Uh, we're, we're still working on that. So with that, uh, we are sort of in the process of unveiling this paper and rulemaking in California that uh, would get into a, uh, a new framework that we're calling UNITE. Uh, that may change at some point, but that's what we have today. Uh, again, addressing the issue of very disparate basket of rates, way too many boutique rates in California that are trying to do many different things, all, all well intended, of course, um, dealing with cost recovery and allocation and equity issues. We've got to address that in California, affordability. Uh, we have a basket of supply side um, demand response programs that are market integrated, but divorced from the rate designs and not very well uh, integrated, frankly, together. And so, um, and we have distribution level uh, demand response issues as well that we want to resolve. And so together, we're going to bring these these elements together in a universal dynamic economic signal or unite as I was saying and eliminate some of the complexities of, of our disparate programs and rate designs and create a centralized hub around uh, pricing for the future uh, real-time pricing in particular scarcity pricing at the generation level and here are some of the elements the six kind of um, overlapping uh, segments that we intend to introduce to the market um, in one United framework program over the next several years, over the next few years. Um, again, going back to the pricing problem, we have, um, we really don't have a standardized place where universal access to current electricity prices exists, um, as strange as that may sound. And so we're working with the Energy Commission in California to um, hopefully bring that uh, off the ground very soon. That's that's kind of step one, right? Simple as that. Uh, then introducing dynamic prices based on real-time wholesale energy costs on an opt-in basis, of course, to begin with. Um, then we're going to, um, around that, you know, uh, alongside that, modify prices um, given localized grid conditions, the lo locational marginal pricing that was referenced earlier. And we want to make sure that we are bringing these things together. And really what we're reflecting on here uh, as well at the capacity level is a more distributed, more dynamic, scarcity-based capacity cost recovery, fixed capacity cost recovery dynamic, um, as opposed to loading up a lot of our cost recovery into the hottest hours, most expensive hours of the year for recovery. Uh, and then finally, uh, transitioning to a bi-directional price, more of a buy-sell environment, not just an import price as we have um, in the current NEM framework, but also a, um, an export price, a, uh, an export compensation price. Um, we're thinking that that's probably going to be a symmetric price uh, in the beginning, but it could disaggregate into an asymmetric price for, for various reasons once we have more sophistication around technology that can handle this. Um, and then finally, very importantly, for customer protection and for revenue stability at the utility level, uh, we foresee that a subscription option, meaning prepay subscription levels of service based on a customer's previous 12 months of usage uh, might be necessary. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a moment. And then finally, this is a few years down the road. We, we've got a lot of technological development to do before we feel confident that this will actually work, but more of a buy sell, pay in advance, lock in prices in advance, transactive feature. And we have piloted transactive energy uh, in California. And we feel that the proof of concept really does work. Um, a lot of this is gonna have a bunch of dependencies, of course, that we will talk about in the Q&A, but this gives you a little bit of a sense of what we're dealing with in terms of you know, the flexible fixed cost recovery prices, generation, fixed cost recovery, uh, locational marginal pricing. These are just mock-ups that illustrate that there's um, you know, a real spiky uh, sort of um, hourly stacked prices uh, that, we that we're dealing with here on winter and summer days and in different ways. And so this is the, um, the composite hourly prices that we sort of envision as the end state when it comes to a transactive energy network in the future. Um, so this is a more simplified diagram here, but wanted to share with you. Um, our vision really is this statewide hub or portal that is gonna feed real-time energy and scarcity capacity prices to the grid, to customers at every level from commercial and industrial to agricultural and residential. And this is really important that we get these prices to devices, that we increase the amount of flexible demand options for customers and hopefully reduce peak loads in a more meaningful way um, and see the synergistic effects therein, meaning lower peak loads, 
less infrastructure costs incrementally long run for the utilities and for customers, and hopefully reductions in wholesale energy costs as well. I know I'm running out of time, but just wanted to show you a diagram of the subscription element of this proposal, which we um, are, are feeling we need to do a lot more research on. But um, this is just diagrammatically how we envision things would go. Currently under a, under a TOU rate for a customer, say a residential customer has a TOU rate that looks like the blue line, the dotted line would be something more of a reality in response to uh, real-time price uh, rate as they are uh, being introduced to the market. And so um, the customer would effectively be billed at its TOU rate from the year before, but would be able to arbitrage against that to, um, you know, to get to improve billing position, for lack of a better term. Um, any excess subscription would be credited at the uh, real-time pricing rate, and the description and the difference between the subscription and the actual consumption uh, would be billed, of course, at the RTP rate. Um, there's a lot to talk about. Six minutes isn't nearly enough, <laughs> but I, I look forward to questions. Just wanted to, to hit on before I close, just other customer protections that we're contemplating for this United framework. Uh, an income graduated fixed charge in three tiers um, that would be partially paid for by climate credit or cap and trade revenues. Um, we wanna create income strata to alleviate some of the affordability pressures on lower income customers. Um, but also the income graduated fixed charge is meant to address any cost shift concerns that could result from a real-time pricing scheme of this nature or transactive energy scheme uh, of the future. And we're gonna be doing more annual updates, more frequent updates to marginal generation distribution capacity costs to make sure that we are moving the needle and understanding better how those system savings and efficiencies are accruing to the system as people react to these rates. And then finally, a very robust marketing education and outreach program and evaluation to, be, to better understand over the next few years how our pilots are working and what sorts of tariffs we can introduce to the market in two or three years down the road. Lastly, this is just a, a, just a very fun kind of diagram that shows uh, you know, what we talk about with all these different kind of, you know, the, the Internet of Things and the future, the vision of the future where transactive energy platforms run by uh, the DSO or the um, distribution system operator or utilities, LSEs, interfaces with um, the home, you know, and different transactive energy service interfaces work. And, and all of this, of course, aiming to increase electrification and lower carbon and lower prices for customers. Looking forward to your questions and I better stop there. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Paul. There's a, uh, I would say there's a lot to unpack there for sure. Uh, yeah, well, we only have 15 or 20 minutes to ask questions by me, so we may not get to all of them. Okay, so if all the speakers could turn on their videos, please. Um, so yeah, I'm going to spend about 15 minutes uh, with some Q and A with the speakers, and then we'll shift over to questions from from the audience. Okay, so let me get rolling. So start, let's start with Bea, so you, you went first. So in, in your study, you talk a lot about cost reflective tariffs, um, but you didn't give a lot of detail into you know, what you did in that. And there's considerable variation in, in you know, what is cost reflective, like how spatially and lo you know, location-based, time-based do you go? Um, that, that's a big subject to debate. So I guess the question I have is, can you describe what you mean exactly by cost reflective tariffs and how you develop them? And lastly, more broadly, what should be, you know, this is a complicated question, but what should be included in that calculation? Thanks. Uh, yeah, so basically, you know, we can think about cost reflective in a uh, variety of different ways as starting from just the volumetric rate, you know, how, how cost reflective is the volumetric rate itself. Uh, you know, what we did in our revenue neutral tariffs when we started with approximations to cost reflectiveness and the volumetric rate, for example, by using time of use uh, prices or critical peak pricing. We also had a tariff that had real time prices. And then we developed these two, what we called, you know, much more cost reflective tariff, where the, the whole tariff, the entirety of it, reflected the different underlying costs associated with consumption. Now we we did not look at distributional uh, co uh, locational costs uh, just for simplicity, but we did allow the underlying tariff portions to vary. Uh, for example, we had a fixed charge to recover billing and metering costs. This is like once per month. Uh, there's a, um, a demand charges to recover the locational distribution uh, capacity costs as well as the generation capacity costs. Then for the volumetric rate, we had uh, 
you know, we ran an economic dispatch model, calculated real-time prices and passed that through to the customer. Um, and then basically, you know, with these cost-reflective tariffs, we calculated what would be the revenue that was collected by the utility from them. And there was some sort of uncollected revenue. There was a gap in what the revenue requirement for utility was and what was collected. And so we, we went two different ways. We basically applied those uncollected revenues in a flat volumetric tariff or in a fixed charge, which the fixed charge would be more economically efficient. And so what we saw was that with this, you know, fully cost reflective rate, the one that was more efficient with the fixed charge, it had very, very low volumetric rates. So that led to, you know, a lower incentive to invest in solar. Um, and I'm sorry, David, what was your final portion of the question? Yeah, I guess I was more thinking, you know, in, in a model, obviously, there's simplifying assumptions that need to be made. Um, but I guess, you know, if we're thinking about cost reflective tariffs, you know, how far do you think, I mean, in theory, you would want to push it, but in reality, balance, balancing the, the real constraints that we face. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, you know, there, there's a lot of concern about Know, how will individuals be able to respond to these prices? What kind of, you know, is there enough automated technology to allow for uh, responsiveness to happen automatically? Um, and, and there are concerns about sort of uh, affordability under different tariffs. So what we've seen is, is more of a move towards, you know, approximations, such even having a time of use rate or, you know, a real-time price volumetric tariff can take you a really long way in, in achieving some of the better decisions at the household level without having to go the full path of like truly cost reflective tariffs. I mean, I think the solutions that Paul was presenting today is a really interesting solution. And I'm excited to see if, you know, what, what kind of outcomes would we get once that's implemented. And hopefully we'll be able to gather data after that UNITE is implemented. We'll be able to run some analyses next post. Great, thank you. And, and I guess this this leads to a question for Burchin. So there's, uh, you know, to do these cost reflective tariffs has a ton of information, right? Especially about the characteristics of the grid. Mm -hmm. So you consider a number of different information asymmetries and given the time constraints, it'd be useful to, because in your paper, you emphasize the, the information on the grid is a really big challenge from information asymmetry. So could you describe a bit about kind of the channels through which information asymmetry about the grid and the cost mm -hmm. of resources on the grid has on your analysis? Um, sure. So the, the two main, uh, well, we looked at three kind of problems. One is imperfect foresight, and that is mostly the channel is to risk of the investors. So if there is imperfect foresight, there is higher risk, and that creates um, some incentives to change, um, you know, change their investments. Then in terms of information asymmetry about the grid, the two main parameters we looked at is hosting capacity, um, and um, consumer demand. So, you know, when a DER aggregator is thinking about um, investing, and if they don't know exactly what the hosting capacity at a particular bus is, uh, yet they have beliefs about them, they could have optimistic beliefs or they could have pessimistic beliefs, they changes their, that, that changes their incentives for investment. Similarly, about consumer demand. So if, uh, you know, if the consumer demand is high, that, that means you know, real-time energy prices are going to be high. So you know, say on their value stack or the LMP, that price is going to be high, but they are not exposed to that on their net metering. So depending on the type of the compensation scheme, essentially the information asymmetry changes or your, your beliefs about the information changes your expectation. So that changes your information. Um, the, that changes your um, investment um, incentives. And what we see is, you know, from a social welfare perspective, thinking about um, 
thinking about increasing efficiency, the most of the drivers really come from figuring out or directing DER investment to the most valuable location in the grid. Our test system is New York City test system, so just, just Manhattan. And of our six buses, only one of them was congested. So the difference between uh, a net metering uh, kind of compensation where, you know, the DR investment is more uniform throughout Manhattan um, versus a value stack or a DLMP based compensation that could take into account that additional um, that additional congestion in one of the buses that made uh, one of the you know that, that made the biggest efficiency gain. So thinking about that kind of information and what information drives the most of the most of you know your investment expectations about energy prices or capacity prices or environmental you know value depending on the underlying um, on the you know underlying compensation mechanism. So the driver depends on the type of the information asymmetry and also if you are pessimistic or optimistic that also interacts with the with the underlying um, compensation mechanism. And just a quick follow up. Um, do you think so? Paul talked a lot about more information on real time prices, mm -hmm. where you are on the grid. I mean, would that alleviate from a policy implications perspective a lot of the challenges that you think you faced or that you, you know in your analysis? Um, I think that would uh, alleviate some. But again, it depends on the type of information. So a real-time energy price is not necessarily going to give enough information about hosting capacity uh, to you know, think about for, for a DR aggregator to think about where would be the you know, best place to invest in or whether there will still be capacity to invest in. If there is a way that, you know, if the underlying price signal could lead to differential congestion signals between different buses, for example, that, that could help. But depending on the type of the information asymmetry we were talking about, it may not alleviate all. It will alleviate some. Yeah, that's really interesting. So let me shift over to Paul, or sorry, Michael, to make sure I, I give everyone a chance. So Michael, your, your analysis looks at kind of electricity markets aren't just all wholesale markets, you know? So you look at the interaction of these numerous markets with diverse products uh, with different time scales. So you got wholesale markets and various AS markets with different type of reserve products. So we talk a lot about the optimal DR tariffs and the need for cost causation. So with this in mind, do, you know, how do we merge, you know, marginal cost pricing across these different products and markets, right? Because you talk a lot about DR products can provide AS services in these other characteristics. So does such compensation have to be consistent with marginal cost pricing for all products and all time scales? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by does have to, but, uh, you know the the efficient way of running the markets is to to uh, make them compatible and um and actually you know the marginal cost kind of percolates uh through the uh the, the substation uh, down to the uh to the distribution network where additional constraints are there that we that are, are very easy to uh, to incorporate for example uh, the hosting capacity depends to a, to a great extent on the capability of service transformers uh, to uh, serve uh, load without uh, without uh, going up into flames. And 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 we shouldn't, you know, when when we when we talk about DRs and and uh, sustainable networks and so on and so forth, we shouldn't focus on what is happening today when you have when you have a trace essentially of DERs uh, relative to the DERs that we're going to have in, uh, in 10, 15 years when 30% uh, of overall uh, consumption of electricity may go to electrification, to transportation electrification, electric vehicles. So, so then hosting capacity is incredibly important and it depends on the capability of transformers and service transformers which can can warm up and, and, and burn out if you don't uh, manage them appropriately, unless 
you invest two or three times the actual capacity that you need. Hmm. So, and so, so if you do not coordinate, uh, you know, in a future sort of scenario with a lot of electric vehicles, for example, which is which is when uh, when hosting capacity makes uh, makes sense. Uh, so, uh, so if you do not want to have uh, huge investments in service transformers, which, by the way, make up 10% of more of the of the of the uh, resource resource cost, the capital cost in distribution networks. You know, it's huge, and um, so unless you sort of manage to capture the uncertainty that will result from the from a, a proper coordination, uh, you'll have to uh, you'll have to invest uh, huge amounts. So, so we are facing something at the distribution network. We are facing something which is slightly comparable to what happened when uh, when air conditioning was adopted on a on a wholesale <laughs> uh, rate in the six, in the sixties and seventies. Except now uh, you are going to have mobility and um, uh, and a lot more degrees of freedom in terms of when. Uh, some of the charges when they're uh, when electric vehicle charges when they're plugged in. So so if we so so most of the studies ignore this incredible uh, num um, amount of degrees of freedom that we will have with with new types of demand, which are distributed energy resources associated with um, uh, with electric vehicles. Also, the capability of um, the capability of uh, of rooftop photovoltaics, of alleviating some of the constraints, not having to do so much with uh, with transformers, but having to do with uh, with maintaining the voltage at the distribution network, is something incredible. The you know in California the, 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 there's been added a uh, an obligation to have to have uh, smart uh, transformers that can actually um, uh, moderate uh, this uh, this additional constraint. And if you know, if one if one ignores the ability to adapt and to respond, then we have these fallacious uh, sort of statements that uh, prices are going to skyrocket, they are going to go to infinity, and so on and so forth. You know, there are all sorts of studies that that are showing this this by by many engineers like myself, right, um, who who ignore the ability to adapt. So if you have the ability to adapt, then these this extremely high prices uh, go away. And also if you bring the demand into the picture, this demarginalization uh, of, uh, of electricity costs uh, is not uh, true anymore because the demand uh, through its, its utility and so on is going to uh, sort of bring sanity into this picture. So, yeah. so I think if you, if you do it right and if you recognize the additional constraints, Maintaining voltage, not allowing uh, transformers to blow up, uh, then you can have such a coordination that that allows you to uh, go forward with a much more rational expansion of the of the distribution. Of it. And then there are other issues having to do with uh, with aggregation and so on that have been mentioned, which is extremely important. And um, you know the aggregators of distributed energy resources they would tend to particularly if you allow the distribution network operators would would have knowledge of the of the of the system cost which which may actually um, you know um, which which may actually uh, diminish uh, social welfare because they can take advantage of that particular sort of knowledge that they have well, it sounds like uh, Paul has his work cut out for him here. Um, so on that note, let me let me give you the last question that I'll ask Paul before we move over. So the, the framework you're considering is ambitious um, and depends critically across kind of all stakeholders in the utility sector. So we're talking like the DER community, consumer advocates, and the tech community. So these sectors are likely to have different preferences and incentives, to say the least. Um, so, so the question I have is, what do you foresee as kind of a key top barrier or challenge to pursuing and implementing this integrative framework of demand flexibility and demand management and incentivizing more targeted DER compensation? 
Good question. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's a few there's a few barriers, and I think one of them that, that must be hit on. It's well, I'll, I'll focus on two, and, and one of them is the technological barrier that I think needs to be addressed. We've had some conversations uh, with folks at Google Nest and other uh, you know DER companies, you know Tesla, uh, various um, representatives of the of the uh, storage industry and solar industry, etc. And I think there's just a concern about the level of complexity that could arise as a result of the the more transactive nature of the grid on, on the distribution network in particular and, and thinking through it's not so much that we can't conceive of um, how we might take a more dynamic approach to uh, to fix cost recovery for, for generation, I mean, you know, for capacity, but um, I think there's a, a bigger concern about if the pricing scheme is too dynamic um, and you know, there's there's too many more transactions on the grid and location based pricing and all of the above that, you know, will will the programmable thermostat be able to really run the home in a set it and forget it way such that a residential customer that's not quite as savvy about, you know, all of this and arbitraging their billing position or what have you uh, will be able to just sort of set it and forget it and walk away from it. And I think I think what we've discovered in that in that conversation, at least with with consultants to Nest and, and other programmable thermostat folks and programmers in general in Silicon Valley um, is that they can foresee definitely getting to a real-time pricing market, getting up to the point of having, um, you know, more fully robust uh, dynamic pricing tariffs on an opt-in or opt-out basis, which is kind of our, our long-term goal, um, having the real-time rate being represented and, and getting people to focus on a bi-directional price. I think those things are all possible today uh, with technology we have. I think when you start introducing much more complex uh, transactive buy sell, you know, future positions. Um, then it starts to get more complicated. So I, I may be, um, I may be sort of simplifying that. But just the bottom line is that I think technology needs to mature a bit on this. We still need, and not just on the on the higher end of the programmable thermostats, but again, concerns simply with a pricing portal that works, not just at the statewide level, um, but at the utility territory level, at the um, locational hubs, and somehow aggregates up and provides the kind of real-time information that customers can rely on. So I just think there's a technology barrier here. I know we can get through it. It's just, you know, we need to think about the timing. And um, I know that there's going to be consumer advocates that have concerns about that. I know that there are um, DER companies, again, that are that are having a little bit of heartburn trying to envision just how complex this could get. Um, and then obviously, you know, Google Nest wants to serve many masters, you know, in having contracts with different utilities and also um, customers that that are that would be concerned about how a programmable thermostat could handle um, all of these things at once. So, so that's one thing. And then the other the other piece uh, is a combination of the uh, what I mentioned in my in my slides about uh, you know. Uh, and Bea just um, re referred to as well, which is, you know, is there a revenue shortfall problem that we're not seeing with uh, more widespread real-time pricing? Uh, is there something that we will need to worry about with regard to, um, you know, participants and non-participants or those that participate more than others uh, in terms of keeping the utilities whole, keeping revenue stable? Uh, we don't want to create another, you know, net energy metering situation politically in California where we're having this constant fight about, you know, um, how to unwind the subsidy now that the market is fully functioning or mostly fully functioning um, and um, how to get, you know, the cost shift addressed. I don't think it's exactly the same situation. Uh, in the case of NEM, we have uh, really just frankly a, a straight subsidy being offered to the market to, um, to take on a rooftop solar, whereas a real-time pricing structure of the nature that we're contemplating should result, hopefully, if it's done well, if it's done right, should result in the lowering of capacity costs and benefits being flowing back, flowing back to customers. And I think we have to be honest with ourselves that rather than having a, a four-year general rate case cycle where we adjust cost components only on an every three or four-year basis, uh, we need to look at it more frequently and demonstrate that this is a slightly moving target when it comes to a more active uh, marketplace that revolves around a real-time price, meaning that the cost to serve customers should go down a bit if the grid becomes more efficient, if load factors start to improve in terms of grid, grid and resource utilization, um, but then also how those, um, how those benefits flow through to customers in terms of pricing. So we have our work cut out for us. This is a complex work, but um, we're, we're feeling pretty confident about at least the first few steps over the next year or two. Can I Thanks just respond to something that you said, Paul? Sure. Uh, you know, I just want to, state that I don't believe that NEM itself is a subsidy. It's rather the underlying electricity tariff that is inadequate and 
right? Not cost reflective. So once right. you apply NEM on top of a non-cost reflective tariff, that's where the subsidy emerges. You know, if that's you right. had a truly cost reflective tariff, NEM wouldn't be a problem. Correct. And it then, was an over, a bit of an oversimplification. Sorry, who's next? Um, yeah, and I guess this leads to, I, I do want to make sure we don't have a lot of time. So I do want to make sure I get an audience question in here. Yeah. Um, so I would say, you know, we're, we're all, I shouldn't generalize for everyone, but research is pretty consistent that um, there's clear advantages to time and location-based charges, right? So it, both in terms of efficiency, decarbonization, customer choices, uh, et cetera. But there's, there's a lot of opposition to moving towards a more cost-reflective tariff, both from consumer advocacy, environment groups, and, and, and even industry stakeholders as well. So, so I guess the question is, you know, how do we bridge this gap between technical and academic experts saying, hey, you know, we can, we can do better here. We can minimize cost shift concerns. We can be more cost reflective. You know, how, how do we bridge the gap of the, the technical discussion and a lot of the customer opposition to these challenges? And, and I would say this goes to anyone who would like to jump in. Oh, Bertrand, go ahead. Go ahead. Actually, I, I think Michael has raised his hand before oh, me. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Michael, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. I, I just wanted to say very quickly that uh, what we think is opposition maybe um, is based on our <clears throat> focus on uh, real-time prices. And, 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 and Paul actually mentioned that real-time prices should be used to or dynamic real time price should should be used to sort of uh, match or correct uh, things um, that uh, that are different relative to some some sort of operational planning or or or, or, or what we call today hedging uh, hedging markets or day ahead day ahead markets. So if if you run day ahead markets correctly, then even Nest thermostat can can work very nicely by knowing when to preheat when to pre cool and so on in an adaptive way so as to um, as to as to smooth prices and and then if you do if you do this right then the actual real time prices in theory should be and and most of the time should be should should average out to what to what you planned in the day ahead so dynamic but with some sort of forward looking uh, day ahead prices uh, that we see that we see today at the wholesale level, which are not um, are not subject to, to to these huge spikes, you know. So okay, we may have 20, 30 percent uh, higher prices in a, in, a, in in some hour, but not not ten times or hundred times uh, higher. Um, so real time prices should be seen as something that kind of adjusts differences over day ahead or operational planning type of, um, of, of, of costs, uh, which, which Paul, you mentioned, uh, you, you associated to, with time of use rates, perhaps time of use rates are not right. Perhaps we should, we should, we should dynamically uh, uh, adjust uh, to the situation in, in, in a particular hour, the, the, the weather changes and so on and so forth. But, but having this, this day ahead uh, sort of operational planning uh, makes uh, makes real time prices much more palatable and acceptable, and I think customers shouldn't. shouldn't just to be... jump in on that for a moment, if I may, the, yeah, yeah the, the standard that we're going with is the day ahead uh, hourly real time price. So that's what we're starting with. There's a 15 minute market. There's a five minute market that could be a tool, but I think by and large, what we're looking at in this particular paradigm is just the day ahead real time hourly price for planning purposes, exactly as you stated. So I appreciate that additional yeah. note. And Bertrand, you are next. Um, sure, thank you. Um, thank you, David. So I'm going to um, talk about the different aspect. And I think one of the things we need to do as researchers is to really understand and talk to different stakeholders and hear, hear your concerns. I mean, obviously when we're think thinking about locational prices or real-time prices or carbon prices, there are costs associated with these, and you know we do have to worry about other 
it, other than efficiency kind of objectives, we have to worry about energy justice, we have to worry about energy burden. And part of, I think part of bridging the gap comes with, uh, you know, us, and I'm guilty of saying, oh, but this, this is the eff efficient rates, this, this should be that too. So part of it comes from us changing our perspective as well and recognizing that the social welfare has a you know multi-objective function. It is not just about we're maximizing the subject to power flow constraints, but there are different values and we need to take into account those different values. And when when you start thinking about those different values, then this balancing um, act becomes, I think, you know, easier because yeah, maybe we we don't need to go all the way to like a really real time, you know, five minute pricing uh, because you already get a lot of efficiency gains by say going to, you know, going to halfway, maybe, you know, um, not five minutes, but 15 minutes, or maybe, you know, five, you know, five periods with time of use. So thinking about, okay, we have some efficiency gains and we could get capture a lot of a lot of it by going halfway and that could ad address some of these other societal values i think it's a viewpoint that we need to consider both in our policy positions but also thinking about economic en and engineering simulations as well and uh i'll leave the last word to you Bea, because we shockingly are out of time yeah, I guess you know, I, I agree with what Bertrand was saying, and I think there's there's approaches that we can take, right? The fact that that California had default uh, time of use rates, which is at least an improvement upon flat rates, right? And we have to applaud that. And and so I I view this as a sequential issue, right? We implement, let's say, time of use rates, which in in and of itself is an improvement. And then as people become more able to respond, they incorporate more automated technology, get more used to responding to prices, we can start to increase the complexity over time. And I think it's about building price responsiveness. And, and I also think that a lot of the concerns and the arguments against these more complex rates are not necessarily uh, are, are based on either misinformation or, you know, fears. And then there's a lot of research out there that's shown that, you know, more cost reflective rates uh, actually benefit low income customers as they have, you know, they have um, loads that are more amenable to, to this type of pricing. And so they can really benefit from it. And from what I've seen, you know, the flat rates, they just incorporate so many artificial costs in them that we're overpaying for that, we're hedging, right? So we're, we're paying more than we should be. So I think that there's there's both a sequential issue as well as a, a sort of a, amount of information that I think we need to begin to um, convey to, to households about how they can benefit from, from moving to these improved efficiency of rates. Great, thank you. Yeah, and I mean, we could spend all day here. I, you know, there's a lot of questions of equity, um, cost shifting issues, automation and technology. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we, we are out of time. So I, I am gonna move this over to Birchin, who's gonna say a couple last words. Well, thank you, David. Thank you to all of our attendees and our panelists for participating. As Bea said at the beginning, this is the final um, webinar in our um, series um, for this semester, but hopefully, uh, you know, in the future, we will continue these series. I want to um, thank Hillary Collins from EDF, Tokolo Matsubu from EDF, and Anna Kasradze from Policy Integrity, who have been supporting uh, these webinars throughout the year. And um, of course, I would like to thank again to <clears throat> Evan Michelson and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for the support. The webinar recordings will be posted uh, online, and we will also have a blog post summarizing um, summarizing this discussion. So be on the lookout for, for that. Subscribe to our newsletters, and you will be getting invites for the future webinars as well. So thank you again, and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thanks, David.